Hi, I'm John Katoyan, I'm the Literary Manager of Australian Plays, and we're talking today with Jane Harrison about her work, Born Still. Hi, Jane. Hi. Um, so look, basically just tell us about your, your play and, and what the genesis of it was. Ooh, genesis, that's a really interesting word, mm -hmm. given that uh, it's based on a lived experience mm -hmm. that I had. Uh, way back in 1997, I had a stillborn baby um, after my first child. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a intense experience. And I noticed afterwards that there was a lot of silence around, the, around stillbirth mm. and miscarriages. And so I had it in my mind as a playwright that I would write a one-woman show about that experience. Um, in 2010, I wrote it as a short story and then a few years back, I thought now's the time to take that story and make it a one woman show. Mm. Uh, I've introduced a musician as well into the story, but. Uh, right. And so how do you make that decision? Is it just, it arrives and it feels right to sort of transfer it between you know, short story and play? Is, there, is it just distance or? I guess I'd always wanted it to be a one woman play. Mm. Uh, the short story was, um, at the time, I was working on another piece. I was a writer in residence and I had the first draft of that play fl flew out of me <laughs> and I had a little bit of time up my sleeve, so I just wrote this and it also just fell onto the page. Yeah. Turning it into a play has been really about undoing the short story right. to a large degree because, of course, it's very prosy, it's quite poetic and yeah. um, a little bit flat yeah. compared to writing a play, you have to make it very active. So yeah. And so that's, with, with that's a, sorry. No, no. <laughs> that's about the, you know, the technical things mm. of it in terms of, yeah, I think for me writing it as a play is an incredible opportunity to have that private story shared with an audience and hopefully it will resonate with many people's mm. stories. Yeah, and so you're, you know, you've often, uh, in your work, you've previously also, you know, delved into personal histories or, or, or experienced lived experiences. Has the way in which you dive back into material that you're connected to changed over time, or is it still a similar process to access? Uh, well, I feel that this is really the first lived, totally lived experience that I've written. Mm. Um, I usually feel that a fictional story can actually tell more of a truth yeah. than the lived experience because they don't neatly fit into a theatrical yeah, arc. <laughs> so accessing the material, um, I did have the, because I had written it as a short story, I had that to draw upon and then writing it now as a play, once it reaches the page, it is a story for me. It's mm. I can have some distance, so I'm truly looking at, I hope, what will work in the theatrical sense. Yeah. I don't have to get so attached to my own material that I can't let it go. Yeah. Uh, actually, <laughs> the whole story is about letting go in a way. Um, yeah, yeah that's I need to make it the best possible story I can make. Yeah, the challenge of the technical storytelling yep. and, and that personal material. And, and has uh, how has the process been so far for you at the Play Festival um, in terms of you know these last couple of days, this morning yeah, even? <laughs> yeah, so so much happens in a week. It's amazing. Every day we've been in rehearsals, we've had a new script, and of course the material's pretty much the same, mm. but it's been tweaking or changing the tense or rearranging little bits of the mosaic to make it more active and I live for that opportunity to hear the play. If you can have it in your head for, yeah. for years <laughs> and years. It's a totally different experience having a director, a dramaturg, an actor, musician in the room yeah, and working with all of those elements. So you, so you mentioned that you, you know, the, the piece acquired a musician as a sort yes. of second, second character essentially. Um, are you music yourself? How is the writing process of that? that character for one of a, you know, yeah. or another collaborator, how's that worked for you? That's interesting too. I uh, did 
a festival a few years ago called Right Around the Murray, mm. and I, they asked me, did I have a piece of writing that went with a song? So I did have a song, and I delivered 800 words of this play with a piece of music. I'm not going to tell you which piece of music <laughs> it is. And I thought, wow, that adds another element mm. to it. And at the start of the week, Susie D as director was saying, do we need the musician? What's the musician bringing to the piece? As soon as we had the musician in the room, it was like it's the soundtrack to her mm. experience. So probably more, in a way, more filmic than yeah, right. theatrical. Um, I don't know, but yeah. it seems to add a richness. Fantastic. I'm hoping. Yeah. <laughs> and have you written a lot of um, one-person shows? Is no. This, is this again, the first Again, it's the first one-hander. And, and what are you enjoying or discovering about that? I mean, it seems like you knew that that was the f yeah, form for your work yeah. very, very clearly and very early, yeah. but is, is there anything else? Bloody hard. <laughs> Bloody hard writing a one-hander. Um, I have been working on another play, which is a nine-hander. That's also <laughs> bloody hard. <Yeah. laughs> Playwriting Those are hard. Yeah, plays are <laughs> in summation. Um, they all have their own uh, challenges, really. Mm. And you get, with this play, her isolation being mm. you know, that solitary character on the stage and the musician there, but in the background. Mm. Um, yeah, and look, it is hard have, not having, it's hard for the actor, I imagine, doing uh, basically a monologue, mm. uh, not having anyone necessarily to bounce off. Yeah, what's I that think, engine? Yeah, but having the songs is also a little bit of relief, perhaps for her and the audience, they can take a breath. Yeah. Because it is pretty, Grim material. Yeah. I and seem to specialise in grim <laughs> material. You've you've got a special. <laughs> what excites you, I think, about what excites you about the work currently, given that it's a, about to have an audience at, uh, in some respect? I'm really looking forward to it having an audience, uh, to seeing it before an audience. Look, I've just had a few messages from friends recently saying, "Thank you for telling this story. It's my story," um, and I. You know, that sense of the personal story and the specificity of that personal story, and it's a collective story. Mm. It's really a story that, uh, you know, mo a lot of people have either personally experienced or it's been in the family somewhere. Mm. And again, although it's a very kind of gendered story in this version of the play, um, I've had lots. I've had guys also um, very much expressing to me their stories around stillbirth in the family. Yeah, it's a hugely under, it's still a very much kind of an underground yeah. idea, isn't it? We don't, it we don't talk about it or share or... Yeah, it's not like there's a taboo about this story, but it's, it's not something that we tend to talk about there's an awkwardness to this story. There's a, a silence to it yeah. um, in society. And has the work itself taken on aspects of that silence and stillness, or is, or is it frenetic, or what's what is the sort of sense uh, of it? Yeah, uh, it has taken on those silences a lot. But of course, there's the. Um, there's a risk in a play where something as huge as this happening that either before or after fades away. So I've tried to mm. give it um, some, some richness and body in the beginning and then some stillness and then hopefully mm. another story emerges around how she recovers or yeah. how she deals with that silence yeah yeah that's really interesting um and and for you as a, you know as a writer choosing when to to dip in and out of material when to dip in and out of timelines was there you, you know is this primarily a piece about the aftermath of a tragedy or mm. you know, the immediate aftermath the long term how do you decide as a writer what sliver of time to yes. focus on that's a really good question too because there's that get in late leave early kind of bit and I guess even a 
the start of this week, um, a dr dramaturgical question was, what's the timeline? When mm. does it, I know where it starts, but where does it finish? Mm. And it was great to kind of get um, parenthesis around yeah. that, that experience. Yeah, because particularly if it's something that you might still be living with some remnants of or some ripples yeah. of, where do you make your own Yeah, that's right, markers? because you, you never, it never goes away really, but in terms of the play, I have to kind of contain mm. that experience. Yeah, and, and obviously, I mean, our audience would know you um, very much from Stolen and you know, your other brilliant work. Do you think, is there any element to you about our unwillingness or our uneasiness about uh, dead children and lost, you know, lost children and dead babies? And is there any of that, it's cultural you feel or is that not connected at all? Ah, that's another big Huge question. Huge play, yes, sorry. <laughs> So I remember in the research for Stolen coming across a piece by Neville, who was a protector of Aborigines in Western Australia. And he said, I think it was Neville, he said, the mothers soon forget. Now, traditionally, of course, people don't mention the name of an mm. Aboriginal person who's passed away. And was he confusing their, their cultural protocol with a silence around mm. speaking, you know, like, how can you say a mother forgets? Yeah. A mother can never forget yeah. her Misreading child. Misreading the grief. Who's been, who's died or has been removed. So, um, I think in a way, uh, in, the, in this play, Born Still, I talk about another woman who said to me, um, in 40 years, no one ever asked her her baby's name. So there's that resonance, um, you know, there was a generation that did want to sweep it under the carpet, but you just had a stiff upper lip mm. and you moved on. I, I hope I kind of speak for that generation. I felt I had um, permission to talk about it for a while mm. and then you're meant to kind of move on. Yeah. And how do you talk about it? When people say, how many children do I have? Do I say? Yeah. Do I mention the baby that's died? Yeah. And, and I do yeah. sometimes, but not always. Yeah. And what's the space for you to, you know, that thing that li grief isn't linear. Yeah. It doesn't just diminish in a nice kind of That's right. Pattern. Not neat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, someone, someone said grief doesn't have a timeline yeah <laughs> so <laughs> which is not helpful for a play necessarily no <laughs> no that's right and the the task here is to make it into a play mm. so that it does honor the experience of so many people so yeah. many women not just my experience fantastic well thank you so much i think it's I mean, it sounds really exciting if that's the word for it, but it sounds like it's going to be a really interesting piece to, I hope to send so. into the universe as well and see what those ripples are. And I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Thank Thanks, you so much. John.